just before we start, my name is Martin. I'm one of the guys who helps run the events of the Bulgarian Java user group. I'm working as a Java freelancer for most of the time. Now I'm working as an architect for a company called Resolve Systems, where we do an incident management platform, basically an automation engine, which is capable of running Groovy scripts. And aside from that, I'm working on a few tools related to JDK security. In this session, basically, I'll go you over the major JDK security APIs using a tool I've been writing for the several past months, and I'm currently actively developing. And I'll also discuss along the way what are the latest security enhancements in the JDK. So if you have any questions even during the session, please raise your hand and ask directly. So this tool basically is a swing-based utility, which is capable of uh, providing you information about the different JDK security APIs. And along the way, it, it will provide some capabilities for doing different kinds of exercises related to the JDK security APIs. Roughly speaking, the JDK security model is twofold. On one hand, you have the security sandbox model with the Java Security Manager and Access Controller APIs. And on the other hand, you have the JDK security APIs, which are provided for you as developers to use. How many of you have uh, know what a security manager is in Java? Nobody? OK, so then we'll do a recap on what, how does the security sandbox model in Java work using the tool. And then we'll go into the additional APIs provided by the JDK. So, Starting basically with, uh, with a very basic application, you write your code, package it, you use any ID to develop your application and mm -hmm. run it for testing purposes. And at some point, the first thing that happens basically is that before any classes are loaded in the JVM, there is something called bytecode verification that makes sure that the bytecode of your Java application follows the Java language specification. And the bytecode verifier really analyzes the met methods in your application individually by means of control and data flow analysis. We'll go into some more details. So this is the very first step. And the bytecode verification really does a number of things on your application, such as, for example, it checks that each loaded class file has the correct format. It doesn't violate the Java language specification. It checks that any access restrictions are not violated based on the access modifiers that you've specified, pr private, protected, and so on. It also checks things like, for example, you don't try to subclass final classes, and you don't try to override final methods. Uh, you also check that every class has a single superclass, and there are no illegal data conversions. Some of the, these things cannot be fully checked by the bytecode verifier, but these are just preliminary checks that make sure that there are no security violations at the time where your Java application is being loaded. Uh, and there are other things, such as there are no operand stack overflows and underflows. You don't pass more or less parameters to a method that it expects, and so on. So there are a number of things done by the bytecode verifier when your application is loaded. And that's really the very first step. When bytecode verification is done, then class loading kicks in. And in terms of class loading, basically, uh, a class loader, as most of you know, is an instance of Java Lang class loader. There might be some custom class loaders created depending on the type of application you write. For example, if you write a Java managed environment like a Java application server or a noise GI container, you might need to write your own Java custom class loaders. Or even if you write your own simple Java plugin system, you need to write custom class loaders to load the custom applications. Um, and at some point, uh, the new module system in Java also introduced some new ways of loading modules using different class loaders. And since basically JDK 1.2, something new was introduced in the hierarchy of the class loader, which was called Java Security uh, Secure Class Loader. The Secure Class Loader basically is an additional layer of security added to the class loading mechanism in the JDK. And the purpose of the Secure Class Loader is twofold. So on one hand, it provides you with the capability to set the protection domain of each class in your system that you load. The protection domain is basically the set of permissions defined for that class. If you know there is a security policy file which is provided in the JDK installation where you can set different kinds of permissions for your classes. So basically, you can say all the classes that are loaded from that jar file, for example, have the permission to open a socket connection to a particular website. 
or you can delete some particular files on the file system for, from all the classes loaded in that jar file. So the protection domain in the JDK is part of the security sandbox model. You can get the protection domain for each class in your application by calling the get protection domain method. And it contains a set of permissions, the location of where your classes are, load, are loaded from, and eventually the set of just principles or the attributes of the current user that runs your application. We'll talk a bit more about JAS uh, in a few moments. How many of you have used or know what JAS is? Or Java Authentication and Authorization Service? Nobody. OK, so we'll review JAS in a few moments. So the secure class loader, as we said, is twofold. The first uh, purpose is to set the protection domain for each class with the set of permissions for that class. And the second person is to enforce some additional security checks at class loading time, such as, for example, do you have the capability to actually instantiate a, a class loader? Uh, this is something you can restrict applications from doing, uh, from creating class loaders, and this is enforced at the level of the secure class loader, which is one layer below the URL class loader. And at a later point in JDK 1.4, uh, there was a need to define a particular set of permissions based on some users that you authenticate in your Java applications. In JDK 1.2, when this notion of secure class loading was introduced, there was no way to define permissions based on the user that executes the application, but just on the set of, on the location of where the classes are loaded from. So the JAS framework basically provides you with the capability first to authenticate users using different mechanisms like relational database, LDAP server, and any kind of authentication source you might want to use. It's very pluggable. And at the other point, the JAS framework provides you with the capability to bind those authenticated users based on their attributes to a certain set of permissions as defined by the JDK. The permissions in the JDK extend from a particular permission class, and there are like 30 or 40 built-in permission classes, such as file permission, socket permission, and so on and so forth. You can create your own permission classes for the needs of your application. So the JAS framework basically provides you with the capability to assign permissions based on the users that you authenticate in your Java application. OK, so when bytecode verification happens and then secure class loading happens uh, when you run your application, uh, there are a few more things considered in the JDK security sandbox model. First, as you know, basically Java provides you with uh, automatic memory management capabilities. Uh, which means that it, in terms of um, security, that not only provides you with a secure way to um, disallow you from doing certain types of attacks, such as buffer overflow attacks, which, as you know, are possible in C++. For example, you cannot basically go beyond uh, the dimensions of a certain array and provide some custom code that, that will be executed as part of method parameters. And as you know, the managed memory notion in the JDK is uh, defined in several areas. We have the Java heap, and then we have the thread stacks, which is the local thread memory for each thread in the JVM. We also have certain system areas, which, has the, which are the method area, which defines the, the source code of the methods that you load in your application. And you have the constant pool, which basically stores the constants that you use in your application. These are the managed memory areas of the JDK. However, uh, as you know, you can still go off heap. So you can use, for example, the unsafe class and several other utilities provided by the JDK to allocate memory outside of the, of the managed memory in the JDK. And this is pretty much done for different kinds of purposes. For example, if you do want, want to do some kind of performance optimizations, uh, you want to use more memory, which is not available by default on the allocated memory of the JVM, you can go and use off-heap memory. However, as you might guess, this off-heap memory is not managed by the JDK, and it opens up uh, um, a number of security issues, such as, for example, buffer overflow attacks. Uh, another type of security consideration is the, the strong data typing. As you know, uh, the Java type system is strongly typed. Uh, you need to specify explicitly the types when you define your instance variables, local variables. However, um, there are some additional checks which are done on the type system. Uh, and that pre pretty much prevents you from doing uh, 
uh, unexpected casts, for example, to cast from one type to another type which is not compatible. However, uh, on a smaller scale, the type system in the JDK can be exploited. And uh, there are several classes which basically allow you, such as the unsafe class, to basically do type casts which are not managed and checked by the JDK at class loading or uh, at class loading time or during bytecode verification. And those kinds of attacks called type confusion are still possible on a smaller scale in the JDK. However, this is possible if you use those APIs which allow you to do this type conversion, uh, not as part of the casting mechanisms provided by the JDK. So on a smaller scale, this is still possible. However, it's pretty much alleviated from what the JDK provides. And now, now that we've basically loaded our application, we've done bytecode verification, class loading, and we've discussed briefly the security considerations around the JDK, the core of the security sandbox model is uh, the capability to allow you to load untrusted code from, from different kinds of sources. Before JDK 1.2, you had the capability to run applets in the browser, and those applets weren't sub a subject of permission checking. So the security model basically is defined by the security sandbox model, is introduced in as early as JDK 1.2. This is more than 10 years from now. However, this security sandbox model applies up to date. Uh, at the core of the security sandbox model in Java are two main classes. One is the Java Lang Security Manager class, and the other one is the Java Security Access Controller API. And both of those utilities are used to do permission checking. So you specify permissions by default in the security policy file which resides in the JDK installation. And those two APIs are used to enforce and do permission checking. The Security Manager API is, is an older one. You need to have a Security Manager installed either programmatically by calling System Set Security Manager when you start your Java application, or, or passing it as a parameter to the JVM when you start up your application. And the Access Controller class is a newer API which provides just a set of static methods to do permission checking. You don't need to have an instance of an Access Controller installed. So there are different ways to set the security major, as we said, by calling set security major and passing the Java security major parameter. When you do that, you start having your applications uh, being permission checked. By default, all the applications that you write don't have a security manager installed, meaning that there is no permission checking done. You can write to the file system, you can open sockets, you can do whatever you like, and that's not a subject of permission checking. However, when you have installed a security manager, uh, there is a certain set of default permissions specified in the security policy file, and you can extend them. In this particular example, we say that we grant the lib.jar library in some directory of your class path, the capability to delete the CWindows folder. And when basically you give that permission to the lib.jar, it starts becoming in effect every time you try to delete something from the CWindows or any subfolder in your Java application. And there are two rules of thumb to consider here. When you specify that you, you can delete the CWindows folder, this automatically implies that you can delete any subfolders in CWindows, such as CWindows System32. This is a capability of the Java permission system. Um, as we said, when you load all the Java classes during class loading, there is a protection domain set and you can get it by calling the get protection domain method. This, get, this protection domain basically identifies and is used by the security major and access control APIs to do permission checking. So you get the protection domain, and then for each permission defined by your class, you determine whether you have that permission. And the way it works basically is by calling the, the security manager dot check permission method. In many places in the JDK code base and some managed application servers, you can see calls like security manager or access controller dot check permission. And there are some custom implementations also which don't use the security policy file, such as, for example, if you write Java stored procedures in Oracle database, it stores permissions in a relational database table and not in a security policy file. And there is a custom implementation of the security manager there that reads those 
relational database tables and does the permission checking. And really the, the core of the Java module system is the check permission method. So to do permission checking, you define an instance of a particular permission. In that particular case, I use socket permission, which is part of the JDK. I create a socket permission for github.com on ports 8000 to 9000 uh, for the permission to connect or accept connections from, from that range of ports on github.com. Then I get an instance of a security manager installed in the system. And in order to make sure that I, in fact, have a security manager installed, I have to check that that reference is not null and then call the check permission method. When we call the check permission method, what happens is that we get the current stack trace uh, of, the, of the application. And for each frame in the stack trace, we get all the classes. And we check that all those classes have the socket permission provided as part of the security policy. Even if there is a single class that doesn't have that socket permission, there is a security exception thrown for the application. And in that manner, basically, many application servers and managed, managed environments define custom permissions for which they check. For example, the OSGI specification defines, for example, service permission, which allows you whether your application has the possibility to retrieve or register a service to the OSGI service registry. The Java E system also defines a certain set of permissions you can use in your Java E applications. And also you can do the same using the access controller utility. It's pretty much the same example with the main difference that you don't need a an instance of access controller installed. You just can call the static check permission method, which does exactly the same as the one from the security manager. In fact, the security manager APIs, API delegates its operations to the access controller API. So you can use any of them. And you can also do uh, an additional set of activities, such as, for example, uh, you can uh, do privilege escalation. To give you an example of how this do privileged method works on a security manager or access control, imagine that you have, let's say, a WAR file that needs to write to some uh, to the file system using some logging service provided by the Java E application server. However, by default, the Java E application server disallows applications to write to the file system. But for that particular case of using this logging service, the Java E application server needs to provide WAR files with the capability to write to the file system. And so the, the application server needs to wrap the actual writing to the file system in a do privileged call, which means that when you call do privileged, the current call stack is skipped to the point of where you put the code inside do privileged. So all the code above, above the do privileged call is just skipped. And that code pretty much, that stack trace is coming from the war file, meaning that it does, it's not checked for permissions. And in that case, you temporarily escalate the privileges from the application server to enable writing to the log file. You can also do other things, such as change the currently active user by calling subject.doas or subject.doas privileged. The subject class is part of JAS, which we'll review in uh, several sections. And basically, the reason here is that temporarily you can also switch to another user, which has, more, which has temporarily more permissions. Or you can combine both operations, do privileged and doas, by calling the doas privileged method. So that's pretty much how the Java security sandbox model works. This is really something that's been out there since JDK 1.2. However, the JDK defines a number of other APIs which you can use directly programmatically. Uh, those APIs are organized as a set of uh, distinct libraries provided by the JDK. And to start with, with uh, some of them, let's uh, start, for example, with the JSSC API. So the JSSC API is one of the major APIs of, uh, in the JDK uh, security portfolio. It provides you with the capability to, to establish uh, TLS connections between clans and servers. Um, the SSL set of protocols is, as you, most of you know, is de, fa de facto standard for securing communication between parties. It's also used to enable different kinds of SSL VPNs and so on. And the support for TLS in the JDK is provided through the uh, JSSC API, or Java Secure Socket Extension API, which has two modes of operation. The one which most people use is the blocking mode of operation, which is very similar on how you would create communication between a client and a server socket. The only difference here is that you have more parameters and more configuration to, in, to add to this socket communication to, to enable TLS, as we'll see. Uh, 
And the other more complex mode of operation, which is the asynchronous mode of operation where you don't block calling socket.accept, uh, is much more complex to use. However, it's still available and you can use it in the JDK. However, it's not widely used by applications. And up until JDK 9, uh, the JDK provided support for the TLS 1.2 version of the specification and older versions. And as of JDK 11, which was released recently, there is also support for TLS 1.3, which introduces a number of, of improvements in terms of the uh, performance of the TLS handshake process or the initial negotiation between the client and the server. It introduces additional security mechanisms, support for stronger, stronger cryptographic algorithms in TLS, and so on and so forth. The JDK, JDK as, as of release 11, provides support for TLS uh, 1.3. And um, the, the core of the TLS uh, protocol is the handshake mechanism, which really establishes the communication between the client and the server. To give you a short perspective, the TLS protocol works in a manner of the client starts exchanging communication with the server. It sends information to the server, hey, I support this version of TLS, this set of cryptographic algorithms. The server says, okay, let's use this cryptographic algorithm, and there is my public certificate. The client takes the public certificate from the server, uses a certificate authority to, to verify the integrity of that certificate. Then it sends uh, a shared key to the server by using that public certificate by the server. Uh, and at some point, when they exchange the shared key, the client and the server have finished the TLS handshake process and can start exchanging messages uh, encrypted with the secret key. And the JDK provides you with the capability to trigger the handshake process by calling the start handshake method on the socket, on the client or server TLS socket. And also you can trigger the TLS handshake behind the scenes if you try to read or write to the socket and you haven't called the start handshake method. Uh, to give you an example of how TL, uh, TLS works in uh, Java, this is an example of a very simple uh, TLS server using GSSE. Uh, first, we set a property called javax.net.ssl keystore, which specifies the keystore for the server that stores the public certificate for the uh, TLS server. Uh, then we specify the password for that keystore. And then we use an instance of SSL, SSL server socket factory to create a TLS server socket on port 445. Then we accept some connection, connection from the SSL client. This is a blocking operation, as you know, until we get something from the client, this blocks. And then we read that the information provided by the client and print it out. And at the same time, the TLS client looks very similar. We set the property to the trust store. And the trust store is the list of certificate authorities that the client trusts. And that trust store is used by the client to verify the public certificate provided by the TLS server. Uh, then we create an instance of a SSL socket factory, which is for creating TLS client sockets, sockets. And we create that again on port 4445. And then we send something to the server. We say, hi, server. From the tool, actually, you can run both examples to see what would be the result. So we start first the, the, the SSL server and then we start the SSL client. And the client basically uh, sends information to the server and the server responds with some more information to the client. This is how TLS works uh, in very simple terms. And some of the latest enhancements related to TLS in JDK is not only the fact that in JDK 11 we have support for TLS 1.3, but also some additional enhancements like, for example, OCSP stapling which is basically the capability to, to do certificate checking from the server and not from the client. And the idea behind this is to offload the client from doing many requests to the certificate authority. Another enhancement introduced in JDK 9 is uh, ALPN, or Application Layer Protocol Negotiation Extension. That's the capability to negotiate the application protocol during the TLS handshake process. And to give you a use case behind this, let's imagine that you have a server that supports uh, HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 2.0 version of the protocol. HTTP 2.0 is the newest version of the HTTP protocol. And there are different clients that support either 1.1 version of HTTP or just 2.0 uh, for newer clients. And when the client connects to the HTTP server, at that point it doesn't know 
which version of the HTTP protocol does the server support. And the LP extension of TLS enables the client and the server to negotiate that version behind the scenes. It's basically a use case which covers this kind of determining the application protocol during the TLS handshake process. And there are several other enhancements. Uh, another interesting one is that now the default type of key stores in the JDK is uh, PKCS 12. Before that, it was JKS or Java Key Store. And the reason for moving to PKCS 12 is that it's a more well-developed general standard for defining of key stores, which is not bound to the Java ecosystem. And for example, if you want to exchange certificates with other types of applications, let's say Python on .NET, if you use PKCS 12, you don't need to do any conversion. If you have JKS key, key, um, key certificates, you need first to convert them using some other utility and then import them to other type of certificate store. Okay, that's, uh, that's about the Java Secure Socket Extension API. JAS, which we mentioned, uh, JAS, as, as we said, is the Java, secure, uh, Java Authentication and Authorization Service, which also extends the Java Security Sandbox model with the capability to bind users to permissions when you load your classes. And uh, Java, the, Java, mm, the Java Authentication and Authorization Service uh, is fairly pluggable. You can use different kinds of authentication providers such as a relational database, some GUI authentication window, and things like this. Uh, and you can also combine them. It's very flexible. In the configuration of JAS, you can specify, I want to use three sources for authenticating my users, a relational database, a GUI, and some LDAP server. And I need, for example, to authenticate the user to all of those three sources. You can create fairly complex and flexible rules for authentication and combining them. And uh, the JAS ecosystem has several main classes which define the JAS API. First, we have the subject class, which represents a user that you authenticate to the system. And each user has one or more principles. The principles are the attributes of the user, such as email address, username, and so on. To authenticate a user and create effectively a subject instance, you need to use the JAS login context, which basically reads the JAS configuration. And that just configuration uses one or more login modules to do the authentication, which are, uh, the JDK already provides some implementation of login modules, such as for authenticating against an LDAP server, but you can also implement your own login module. And when you log in basically a user using uh, the login modules, you create a subject instance with one or more principles. This is how just works in, in very general. Another interesting API uh, in, uh, is the JCA, or the Java Cryptography API. So the Java Cryptography API provides you with a number of uh, ways to create digital signatures, to use different kind of cryptographic shifters and algorithms, and so on and so forth. By default, the Java Cryptography API does not provide you with concrete algorithm implementations. It's just a provider API that defines common set of interfaces that need to be implemented. And the JDK has uh, a default implementation called Sun JS, uh, JCA, or the Sun Java Cryptography Al uh, Architecture Provider. Uh, another library which provides many algorithm implementations and it's used widely is Bouncy Castle. Bouncy Castle has its own implementation of the, the JCA providers defined by the JDK. And pretty much many applications prefer to go with Bouncy Castle because it provides stronger uh, cryptographic algorithms which are not implemented by default in the JDK. Uh, another API uh, is the GSS API. The GSS API can be considered as an alternative to Java Secure Socket extensions in a way that it can be used to, to enable secure communication between a client and a server. However, the GSS API works in a manner of exchanging security context between the client and the server. And the GSS API, for example, is used to enable um, a client application to authenticate against a Kerberos server in Windows, where a token is exchanged between the Java application and the Kerberos server. Um, the GSS API um, is pretty much independent of the underlying protocols that it uses. So it can use Kerberos token exchange or any other kind of protocol that allows you to create a secure token and exchange it between the client and the server. Another API, which is provided by the JDK, is the SASL API, which defines 
protocols for negotiation of how authentication would be established between the client and the server. For example, the client tells the server, I can authenticate using an email address or a username and a password. The server tells the client, okay, let's use an email address and establish the communication by you providing me your email address. And the SASL protocol defines basically this negotiation mechanism between the client and the server for how to exchange authentication data between the parties. We also have a certain set of PKI utilities. Uh, for example, the, the, J, the, the format for storing of uh, certificates and the trust stores uh, is defined by the PKI, PKI utilities. You also have the capabilities to take certificates and do certificate revocation checking against the certificate authority. There are two mechanisms defined for this. One is certificate revocation lists, whereby the certificate authority provides a list just a flat list of all the certificates that are revoked for some reason. For example, a certificate has been stolen. And the JDK has the capability to do uh, checking for that certificate against the certificate revocation list. There is a more flexible mechanism, which is called the OCSP protocol, which is a standard protocol to do certificate revocation checking. And as we said, basically, as of JDK, one, uh, JDK 9, the default uh, format for storing of certificates is PKCS. 12, not JKS. And we have also two other utilities which are uh, done to do uh, JAR signing and verification and XML document signing and verification. The idea behind JAR signing is to make sure that uh, when you sign a JAR file, it cannot be easily modified along the way by some malicious third party. In order to sign a JAR file, you can just use the JAR signer utility provided by the JDK installation. Uh, then you pass the JAR file which you want to sign and some certificate which is retrieved by default from the default uh, key store in your JDK installation. You can also specify a different location for, for the key store, but here you can specify just the alias of the certificate to use. And when the JAR, JAR file is signed, uh, a new JAR file is output which is the signed version of this one. And you can distribute it uh, to third parties. To verify that uh, a JAR file is signed correctly, you can use the verify option of the JAR signer utility, and it basically verifies that the JAR file hasn't been tampered with. You can do pretty much the same for XML documents, not only for JAR files, and that's uh, defined by a Web3 standard which is called XML signatures. The JDK provides support for doing signing of XML documents using the XML signatures um, specification. The way this uh, specification works is that you have an XML document and inside that XML document or just a block of the XML, you embed the signatures for what you've signed in that document. So that there is another section which is uh, a piece of XML basically, which encodes the information of how uh, a particular block or the entire XML is signed um, from, the, from the JDK. Uh, and the way it works basically is that in order to, do, to sign uh, an XML file, you need to use an instance of XML Signature Factory, uh, and then you need to cr create an instance of the digital certificate that's provided from the JKS key store and wrap it in a key info object. And then the, the XML document to be signed is parsed and signed using that key info instance and the XML Signature Factory from the XML Signatures API. So it works in a very similar manner as JAR signing. However, uh, you, don't, uh, you have to use a bit more complex APIs to achieve that purpose. So this is pretty much the JDK security portfolio. And just to give you some insights on some of the latest enhancements, we already mentioned some of them in uh, JDK 9 and JDK 11. Pretty much the biggest effort now in the uh, JDK community is to provide better support for the TLS series of protocols. Uh, which is provided by the JSSE API. As we said, we have uh, version TLS 1.3 supported of the specification, some enhancements of the TLS protocol. Uh, we have newer version of the Java certificate uh, of the Java key store uh, provided uh, during the, using the PKCS series of specifications. There are not many changes to the other APIs which the JDK provides. However, there are some improvements made here and there. For example, um, the oldest version of the SSL protocol, SSL version 1, is now deprecated. So if you have Java applications that depend on SSL version 1, you better migrate to a newer version of the, pro the, of the SSL protocol because at some point this will not be allowed anymore. Uh, 
uh, there are um, a lot of improvements done in terms to remove some APIs from the security libraries which are not really used that much. So there are some methods uh, in the security manager API which are not used and they've been removed. And uh, also another set of enhancements which is, was introduced in JDK 10 was that before JDK 10, the, the default CA certs file, which is, was the trust store provided by the JDK, which stored the list of certificate authorities that you trust, was empty. And now as of JDK 10, Oracle exported a default set of certificate authorities in that file. So you, you now have a default set of certificate authorities in the uh, default trust store provided by the JDK. And um, apart from this, uh, what, we, what we anticipate is more, more uh, support in regard to the GSSC API. However, the security sandbox model will remain the same. How many of you know uh, what is Project Jigsaw and the modularization of the Java system? Okay, like five, six people. So Project Jigsaw aims to split the big and monolithic JDK, which contains more than 5,000 classes into, into smaller modules. And now, here comes the question, how does this affect the security portfolio of the JDK? How is this aligned with the security sandbox model? And the way this works is that we now have the possibility to specify permissions in the security policy file for Jigsaw modules. So in the similar way as you can specify that for this JAR file, you allow, uh, you allow the JAR file to delete the C Windows folder. In the same manner, you can specify that for that particular Jigsaw module, it can do this kind of permission, this other kind of permission. This means that with the module system, there is pretty much uh, no changes to the security sandbox model. However, there is a small set of enhancements related to the fact that now in the security policy file, you can specify uh, a Jigsaw module using a special protocol which is called JRT. Uh, with, this is the protocol that you use in the security policy file to specify that you bind a certain set of permissions for a particular Jigsaw module. So with the module system, the security model remains pretty much the same. There are no changes. So that's pretty much it. If you're interested more in the tool, the tool basically is, uh, for the moment provides more set of exercises you can use to play around with the different utilities. In the current version that I've showed you, there are no exercises at the moment. Uh, on the roadmap, there is more uh, information coming from the security framework, from the security perspective for different kinds of frameworks such as Spring Java and OSGI. There will be more information for libraries such as Bouncy Castle and additional libraries that you can use to secure your Java applications. If you're interested to look more into the, how the tool is implemented, for example, the part that I've shown you where you can run the examples here. Uh, this is implemented using the JShell API, which was introduced in Java 9. JShell, as you know, is a console for where you can play around with the different uh, APIs in Java. And it also provides a programmatic interface whereby you can run different kinds of uh, methods or blocks of Java code using programmatically using the JShell API. Uh, so if you're interested, you can take a look into GitHub, uh, where the tool is. Um, and you can contribute, basically. You can provide some ideas on how to uh, extend the tool. You can also play around with it. Um, and yeah. So that's pretty much all about, it, all about it. Any questions in terms of Java security? Uh, no? Yeah. Uh, uh, what's the difference between like uh, using uh, login context and using security login context holder? So um, login context it's using from the GDK nine start mm -hmm. using. Uh, so th there is no difference uh, starting from the new version of Java using a security context holder and uh, login context. They are the similar or not? What do you suggest to use? So the question was, uh, you mean logging, uh, logging context on, on, on what? Security manager, you mean? Um, no, 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 no security manager. So uh, when we have security context holder, we can mm -hmm. receive our authenticated user, mm -hmm. and our unauthenticated. And uh, in login context, we can receive that subject or any, like, another object which contains our Username or login. Mm -hmm. 
So the, the, the login context in JAS uh, is basically the, the entry point to the JAS ecosystem. If, if I go back here to the, uh, to the, to the API of, so the login context basically, the purpose is to read the, the JAS configuration, to see what modules you use for authentication. These modules all need to implement the login module class. And when you authenticate the user, you call the, the, the login context dot login or something method. It creates an instance of a subject if you have successfully authenticated your user. And that subject has one or more principles. That subject basically is available through the, throughout your entire Java application. You can get it at certain point in time and check what is the current user that's authenticated. And based on that user and that set of principles that the user has, if you uh, do permission checking, if you call the check permission method, it basically checks whether you have an authenticated subject. It gets its principles and it checks whether those principles of that user are defined in the security policy file based on the currently executing context, or the full stack trace. If there is a single class that doesn't have the permissions defined by the, for the particular subject, you get a security exception. So in a way, basically, those principles or attributes are mapped to what's specified in the security policy file to determine permission checking. Okay, other questions? There are two. So, how privileged escalation is protected from uh, being used by malicious third party? Mm -hmm. So, privileged escalation basically, there is, uh, um, if I'm to just go back to the particular uh, slide here. So, here basically, if you want to disallow the usage of, for example, do privileged, you can use a particular permission. There is a set of security permissions which you can define in the security policy file to say, okay, uh, you, I, you, the application cannot use the do privileged method. So you can disable it in the security policy file, basically. Welcome. There was one more question there. Uh, have you checked how these all, all security features impact the application performance and how it like degradates? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Yeah. Measure. So, yeah. So typically, if you have many places where you call security manager check permission, it's a it's a very heavy method. So over the last several versions of the JDK, there has been a lot of effort to improve the performance of the check permission method because it it basically traverses the stack trace, and if you have a lot of this kind of calls, your performance degrades. So now in JDK 12 just with which uh, is now coming out. There is a so-called null security manager which, which you can uh, specify that uh, basically um, alleviates the need to do any kind of permission checking. Uh, however, the check permission method has been optimized over the last uh, several versions of the JDK to, to have better performance. But in fact, it has a performance hit for sure. If the more method, the more permission checks you do, the, the more your performance degrades eventually. Other questions? One there. I think it will be true if I say that most of us uh, write our uh, own applications without even thinking about uh, this uh, mm -hmm. permission checking, uh, mm -hmm. etc. Can you please provide us with some examples when we do really do have to think about it and mm -hmm. uh, when uh, we particularly have to, yep. to think? Yeah, so first of all, this kind of permission checking is done all over the place in the JDK itself. For example, in the file output stream, in all the APIs provided by the JDK, if you have a security manager, automatically you get this kind of permission checks. That's all over the place in the JDK itself. However, if you want to use this kind of mechanism yourself, typically you would like to use that in an environment where you load some third-party plugin. For example, you write some uh, Java application that needs to load plugins, or some gateways if you integrate with third-party system, let's say. That's a very common scenario in the enterprise where you want to integrate with, let's say, if in a bank you want to integrate with 10 more systems in the bank and you want to provide some kind of gateways that you load as part of your application. 
and pretty much you want to sandbox those plugins or gateways using some kind of mechanism, you can use the JDK uh, security sandbox model to do that. And for that purpose, maybe you will define a certain set of permissions that implement the permission class. And you define a list of what each of those gateways requires as a set of permissions. And that's, that's pretty much the use case here. If you have a system that loads and executes third-party source code. The JDK security sandbox model has quite some limitations, you, as you might guess. For example, you don't have the way to uh, specify uh, what permissions is a particular uh, uh, jar file or class file disallowed in the security policy file. You list only the permissions that you are allowed, but you cannot disallow permissions. For example, you say, this jar file is allowed to do everything with the system except opening a socket connection. This kind of flexibility, you don't have it. In OSGI, for example, they've defined an extension of this mechanism to provide this flexibility and specify conditional permissions, for example, based on some conditions. Let's say you're running under Linux, then those set of permissions applied. If you're running under Windows, this other set of permissions applies. This kind of flexibility is missing from the JDK security sandbox model, and you need something else to, to achieve that. Okay, other questions? If no, then thank you for the attention. You can find me now after the session for more discussions. And thank you for attending my talk.